I, I think for me, it's a, it's, it's to, for me, the, the setting the intention is, is kind of giving yourself a direction, right? So it's, it's, I'm going to work towards this goal today. Like, so my intention, and, and for me, it's more, uh, as, or at least on the journey that I'm at, when I set that intention, it's more about how I want to feel at the end of the day. And, and the only way to, to get to that feeling is to accomplish some of the tasks that I set, or at least make progress towards them, right? Like, and, and, and to trust that as long as I focus the time and effort towards that intention, then I'm going to get there. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's and, and focus on the process, not necessarily the outcome is where it's gotten to me. That's kind of what a, setting an intention is for me. All right. We're back again with Joe Palacios. And if you remember that name, he was back on the podcast in the single digit episodes. So today I brought Joe on to talk because he's been working on himself doing wellness and intentions. So I kind of want to see how he's doing it with all that. Joe, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back, Tommy. Really good to be back. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think it's going to be a very different interview from the first one because of all this stuff that I have been doing and been working on. So I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah, for sure. So the first question I have for you is during your time in the Marines, did you get into mindset or anything like that? You know, I, 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 I don't I don't think so. Like, I think there was a lot of stuff going on when I, when I was in and, and, and I, I came in like, uh, pre nine 11, right? Like I was, I came in back in 92 and there was all, there has been so many shifts in Marine culture, I guess you would say, or even in the training stuff as the time I went on through the only kind of close to that stuff I came to was, uh, like midway through OIF while I was in somewhere around 2008 or nine, um, we were going to try like this mindfulness mind fit training. And we did this whole thing where, uh, we took a couple of units and had them go through it with, uh, some company. And they said they got good results. Like the, the Marines had actually participated and actually kind of went into it, but they, but it was kind of under a false pretense. It was, it was talking about, uh, more of having a warrior mindset they really they, they they changed it from what the eastern philosophy of what it would have been right like all of the meditation they didn't want to call it meditation or anything like that i think because it was the military so i thought yeah and at the time i thought well this is because i knew which is this is funny because i knew that it was meditation and it was kind of eastern philosophy that they were going to brand as a new technique to make better war fighters, right? I'm surprised they didn't create a mech, a mech meditation. Right? <laughs> so since I knew that's what it was, I kind of really didn't buy into it then either. Like I was kind of like, oh yeah, this is going to be kind of one of those things. Uh, so I didn't really kind of look into it. I think that was the only kind of interaction with anything like that that I had. But again, I was in the wrong mindset then. I was like, you know, hunter warrior, let's go out and that's, we got to train guys to be efficient is so, where I was thinking. So. I forgot. Did you go to sniper school? No, I did a sniper in doc, uh, back when I was in two, five, a long, long time ago, but no, I never went to sniper school. The reason why I was asking is because I was curious if they did anything, um, to lower your heart rate, something that we may call mindfulness or meditating right now that back good then question. may have just been used for uh, breath control and heart rate. Man, I think the only uh, breathing exercises that I ever did was the brass F, which is the rifle range, right? Do you? I don't know if you ever remember that acronym I, they told I you about. I don't remember that brass acronym. F. It was breathe, relax, aim, stop, squeeze, fire. Oh, okay. brass F. Yeah. So it was like to teaching you to like relax, find that natural pause, stop, and then slowly squeeze the trigger. So, anyway, yeah. yeah. No. No. I no. Think no that, that was. But in a way, that is breath work. You're working it is. 
to be intent uh, intentional with your breath. Yeah. And uh, to find that, that calm and that pause, right. And, 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 and you could do it in like a crazy moment. So you could just kind of speed it up. So, I mean, exactly. So when did you start to look into mindfulness? I don't know. I think, uh, I kind of was starting to brush with it once I got out and I started to go to the South Orange County Vet Center. Um, and then my wife really wanted to, to, she was, my wife kind of like Megan went to like a hippie massage school. So they used to do a lot of that kind of meditation and stuff, which is funny because she's actually going the other route right now. She's on her journey of growth. She's doing all of like these hardcore challenges Right. So for her, like we had this conversation the other night, which was funny. She's like, yeah, you're kind of going diving into that rabbit hole. And I'm like, yeah. And it's, it's refreshing to feel that and to do that kind of stuff. And she's like, yeah, but see, I did that because I went to like that hippie kind of school. And, and she goes, so now I like this, get in your face. You're going to do it. Bro, go. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but it's funny. Cause I've already lived that. And so she's like, and I think where we're at is we're trying to find like, what we got to find is that balance, right? So, right, and as I'm happy going medium. through all this, yeah, as I'm going through all this, and I think one of the next steps that I want to kind of grow into personally is to really kind of look into the idea of that masculine, feminine energies, and then kind of finding the balance, right? Like, because you need them both. Oh yeah, right? you, you got to have that. And uh, so, yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm trying to find that balance. Right. Because you need that masculine, which is the more direct and the more scheduled. He did the masculine energy that at least is what I'm kind of hearing as I journey through this. So, so a lot of I mean, would, did I even answer your question, Tom? You, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> a lot of people would say, like, um, <laughs> drop in your pack when you got out. So, in terms yes. of, of your headspace, did you immediately drop your pack or are you still kind of holding on to it? Or if you, let go of staff sergeant. Wow. You know, uh, I want to say that I've actually gone like a whole gambit of pack dropping levels. Right. And then also where I think at some, some, I think when I first got out, I had a really, uh, I, I was on a mission. Right. So I, I think I still had my pack on. So I really was kind of like focused, but where everything else didn't matter. I didn't need anybody else. I was going to do this by myself, right? Like I was a, uh, for lack of a better way, I was gunny, gunny in it. Like you're going to yeah. do it because I say, and not really kind of opening up and kind of realizing that I could have a team. So, uh, so I didn't drop it. Then I dropped it completely, right? And I was just like, I don't care about anything. I'm not going to do anything. I, I didn't, I, I didn't worry. I didn't want to get haircuts anymore. I didn't want to exercise. I didn't want to do anything. And um, when I look back at that phase and, and, and it's funny because a lot of you guys on here are probably going to connect social media or some people know me already. So you can literally go back and see that part of me when I just completely didn't care because man, I was big. I, I, I think I put on, unhealthy amount of weight i i would say what do you consider and, an unhealthy amount well where i just wasn't I, I wasn't sleeping well i didn't you know what i mean it was it was interfering with quality of life yeah right um yeah i mean i'm not big like this whole uh was that that i think we got to be careful with the whole idea of body image positive or negative like I well, think in, in what sense do you mean by that? Because I, I, I do have some issues well, with the whole. So we were talking on one of my walks. Let's go right into this. Oh, yeah. uh, we have been talking about body positive. Like, and here's the reality of it. We focus on the wrong metric. In my opinion, and it's purely just my thoughts. Weight is irrelevant in the face of body fat. So you could be five foot four, 350 pounds yes. and 11% body fat, which means you are a muscular beast. There's a whole bunch of other health wow. issues that would happen with a guy who's five foot four, who's 350 pounds as a muscular beast. You're, I, I don't think his skeletal structure is really designed to handle that. But in right. terms of body positive, he can be 350 pounds and still look good. 
Whereas right. a person at, you know, five foot eight, 300 pounds or 200 and, pounds and 35% and, and, body yeah. fat is going to have a whole nother world of issues. Exactly. So if and we that's look at the, I, that, that's exactly, yes. I, in other words, I agree with you totally. Yeah. It, like if we look at the actual metric that should matter is an average male should be somewhere between 10 and probably 16 to 18% body fat. An average yeah. female, um, I've read a few books on it. And an average female needs to be above probably 16, but below 30. Um, there's all sorts of metabolic issues that happens with reproduction yeah. with females who are under, I think it's 20%. They have a really hard time getting pregnant. So things yeah. like that are very important. Um, so, and when you, it, and, and when you're talking about that, it, it's your, the body fat percentage, cause there's so many ways to calculate that. And some of them aren't a true calculation and, and actually, uh, you mean like the U S Navy standard? Yes. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I think, I think the best, what you're, you were talking about like that submersion where we're getting an accurate body percentage count because you can carry right. fat in places that when they measure, right. I mean, there's also some other stuff that you well, have to really look into. Correct. I mean, so like, like for, for men, hip, hip to weight ratio is, is very important. Not necessarily. So, um, in terms, so there's also different types of body fat. There's visceral fat, there's adipose fat, there's subcutaneous fat, there's brown fat, there's white fat, there's blah, 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 blah. Uh, go check out some of the health podcasts I listen to, like Fundamental Health Podcast, Model Health Show, uh, Genius Life, uh, Ben Greenfield. I mean, I could go on forever with these podcasts. And they all talk about fat and fat issues. That being said, the best possible way to measure your body fat and we can put this in the context of the military and why the military uses the system it does. So the primary gold standard for measuring body fat is a DEXA scan. Requires specialized equipment, very expensive, time consuming. Right. Next would be less expensive, still need specialized equipment, which would be the submersion tank, how, your uh, buoyancy. Like how much, how much do how you much displace? displace, right? Yeah, how much yeah. do you displace? Um, then another one is the handheld um, electrostatic ones that put a little current through your body and it's calibrated Man, to think, measure how much resistance I, there is. I think, I think I have one here. Then you also have your scales that have that same idea. It goes up through your feet. Um, then you get into, well, and all of these require specialized equipment. Then you get down to the, um, how can the military put a battalion of 1,200 people absolutely the most effective way possible in the shortest amount of time. Obviously, mm -hmm. I don't know how much a DEXA scan costs. Let's say it costs a grand. Right. They're not going to put 120,000 or 1.2 million. I can't do math. 1.2 million, I think, just to make sure that all the Marines are, you know, in the right BCA, in their, their right, body composition. Yeah. <laughs> or are they going to take the time or get the specialized equipment? Same with the submergence tank. You can get away with it with the uh, handhelds. I think the Air Force actually does use the handheld um, electrostatic the, ones. The, or for the, the resistance, right? Electro, yeah. So they came up with the probably nowhere near as bad as BMI, but generally speaking, um, an inaccurate form, which is how we do it. The neck, the waist, and it's a measurement of um, height, neck, and waist, and it gives you a mm -hmm. body circumference. Doesn't even take into account your weight at no. all. So that's the problem with the military one. Now, the worst one, in my opinion, is the BMI. The body mass index, all it really does is calculate the total surface area of skin you have on your body. Again, going back to the example earlier where you have a guy who weigh, who's five foot four, mm -hmm. weighs 350 pounds, and is at 10% body fat, that means 35, per, 35 pounds of his body weight is going to be body fat. Yeah. But the BMI would probably have him at a 40 or 50 and label him as morbidly as obese. Morbidly obese. Yes. Yeah. That is the worst, that is the worst scale that they standardly yeah. use. <laughs> um, again, it's how do you get a rough and I pause because 
when you talk about statistics and studies and stuff like that, how do you get the, the largest amount of data with the least amount of cost over the quickest amount of time? The reason why I pause is because it's the absolute most inaccurate data. So we're working yeah. off a data set that's complete bullshit. Yeah. But we're using that Crazy. to base stuff like insurance off of and everything else. For you and I, insurance really doesn't matter. But for people where it does matter, mm. it's a pretty messed up metric to use. Anyways, back to what you were saying about getting yeah. healthy and all of that. And you know, and that's it, it's just so funny because it, 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 we veered off of that because as I'm going through this growth, like I was focusing on relationships a lot. But then I realized like... Uh, I, I have the energy to focus on other aspects. And, it, and I was thinking, you know, I really should do more PT. I really, I, I, that's my intention is to, is to even be like, sure, I'm getting my mind and my soul right, but it, it's, but my body is all together. So I need to do, I, I want to have, I mean, I, I got to have, you know, I don't even know how to word it, but well, I want the whole, there, I want there to, grow myself completely right there was a mantra with the marines when we were both in mind body soul you know to yes. be the perfect warrior and it's absolutely right you can't yes you cannot be spiritually healthy and mentally as far as like being a devout spiritual person mm -hmm. but not have your mind and right and be 500 pounds it's yes. not a balance each one has to work together and each one should be worked together in a way that reinforces each other, I think. And not only that though, Tommy, look, man, like as, as I'm growing and I'm stepping into my power, right. And my grit, the way I, as Lane would say, and you've talked to Lane, Lane Bale and the, I, uh, I don't think I actually of, have. No, one no. of the authors of the book, right. I'm actually going through this book and, I, and I'm really applying what and then I'm doing it? some other, it's, uh, this is I'm, also an audio podcast, ah, Joe. You're right. Cool. <laughs> this is uh, unleash your homo alpha written by Stephen Kuhn and Lane Bale. So uh, awesome. It, it's just, it's like, a, as I'm learning, like there's people in our lives that are, that are going to come in different, they, they they take on different aspects, right? You have some guides, mentors, uh, resources. It just is, it's like a thing, but it's really a community that you, you bring together, the people. So um, this, it, and then the, what I love about this book and how I've been kind of approaching it is because for me, it's just like that. It's like a guidebook, right? It's like, a, for lack of a better way to say, you know, it's it's uh, it's the pirate code, right? It's, it's not, it's, more guidelines than a manual. Um, so, and I love that because I, I'm also learning that as I go through this and I go through these other journeys, like I'm on a 30 days of intention. Um, and, and I started to read um, some of my sci-fi stuff, which, which of course becomes for me, that's uh, I read into more stuff. And I, I like to think of myself as a creator, right? Like I like to cre uh, take any information and find ways to apply it, right? So I, I started rereading all of the, my Dune books because I, I, I don't know about something about his writing and that whole journey of, uh, and, and the initial series, the whole journey of this kid growing and learning and like kind of just creating, like he becomes the quiz ad had a well, all right now i'm gonna get way into that no, he's no, the no, ultimate totally being fine. right like he's he's complete his body his soul is everything so i i like that i'm rereading that as i'm going through this journey um well that's uh man we've been going down the rabbit so <laughs> no it's, it's all good so um let's go back yeah. to the the idea of the humble alpha for a second yes um, absolutely again i know that from the little group that we kind of have going on helping jose out mm -hmm. that being said so did you consider yourself, because uh, I always find it funny when we talk about um, the, the SOCOM units or some of the Marine units, oh, it's a, it's a bunch of alpha males. Well, that's not really how PACs work. Oh, yes. So yes. Where, oh. I mean, in okay. every PAC, there's, some, there's someone other than the alpha. So yes. um, in the Marines, did you consider yourself an alpha? Did you play the alpha game? Were you? I don't. 
running for squad or platoon no, or company you know, dominance? And what I, does I it think, mean I for think, you to be an alpha? I, I think an, an alpha looks out for his pack, right? So, and, and, and I think they've, look, also I'm a dog, I went through a life of as a dog trainer too. So this alpha, there's always the, what they call uh, that whole alpha model, like, right. It's, it's, which is completely, for the most part, people think of it, it's completely irrelevant. It's wrong for one thing, like the alpha, an, an alpha in a pack is not like, he doesn't rule through fear and domination. That's not how it works. And people have this idea that that's what the alpha does. And he's not. The alpha just recognizes everybody's roles and he elevates them. And he's the, they go to because he kind of guides that, right? He, he keeps the structure. But he's, it's not like he dominates everyone, which is awesome. So, um, and, I, and I actually, um, I was never the loud guy, right? I was never that one that's going to dominate people into doing what they would do. And, and it's, uh, I think it, it held me back in certain ways because a lot of people view an alpha as he's got to be the loudest, meanest, nastiest person, which is so opposite of what a real alpha is. And as I go through, as I went through some of the book and then there's like a whole section on the book where it talks about what a humble alpha is. And for me, as I read through that, it's like, no, that's just what a leader is, right? That's just, it's a, it's a guy that is able to find and elevate what's better in everyone else. Well, so in your, in your thoughts, it properly. how much is, how important is it to be an alpha versus how much of it is just actual leadership ability? Well, yeah, I think it's more about leadership ability. And then again, not everybody's, it has to be a, a leadership and then that, the leader also knows when to step aside, right? Like they, they, they know when to follow as well. So I think it's, again, it goes back to this balance, this balancing act. So, um, yeah. And I think as, uh, as I, as I keep progressing, I keep realizing that, uh, I always goes back to the mission, right? It's, uh, what's my higher purpose. And is that per is, my recognition or the fact that I lead it more important than the actual purpose. Right. Right. Does that so, make, does it make yeah, sense? It makes yeah. double sense. So let me ask you this, as you were getting out, you you retired as a staff sergeant, right? Yes, I did. Okay. So you are level one rung of the staff NCO core for yeah the Marine Corps. So staff staff yeah staff um, commission officer on the bottom of the rungs <laughs> but you're also by definition you'd be considered senior uh senior leadership for the enlisted yes. side uh, especially at a battalion level there's one sergeant major there's one master guns uh first sergeant mm -hmm. per company mm -hmm. a gunny per company typically mm -hmm. and then yeah a bunch and then of staff guys. starts yeah so as you were getting out, you had a purpose every day. You woke up, you had Marines to take care of, mm -hmm. uh, you were doing shit. Yeah. And then you weren't. Well, no, see, actually, uh, it, 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 I, it didn't hit me until a little bit later because I, I actually picked up a mission of what I wanted to continue as I was retiring, right? Was, and again, but it, it applied. But I, and, and I mean, I, for I me, mean it was, dealing, I, I think I, mean, I was still in. I mean, dealing with guys every day, you guys under your charge, there was a day when you stopped having to go see those Marines every day. Yes. Yes. And that's typical. And, and you weren't standing at attention during colors. You weren't leaving, hoping to get in your car before tap sounded just all those small things. Uh, I mean, yeah, we're, we're all patriotic in our own way, but none of us really want to stand at attention <laughs> for five minutes. Yeah. Sorry, on fr people. Friday, fr fr Friday, Friday nights uh, on Camp Pendleton, yeah. where they play so more. And then if so first sorry, Division, people they play to, even more. To, to yeah. burst your bubble. It is more common to see sailors, airmen, Marines, and soldiers running to get inside when they hear the first call to taps than it is for a mm -hmm. bunch of them to be waiting for taps to happen. That's, or even 
colors. Let's face it, that that's the reality. Well, see, I'm not going to sugarcoat for, it. Well, for me, I was one of the unicorns because I was a color sergeant for so many years. So when the, the sounding of colors, I would actually come out. Okay, <laughs> good, so, good for you, Joe. But again, that's just you know, that's just me, right? But my I, point I is, like the, these small details yeah. that we. It wasn't just about formations and telling your guys what to do. It was the small details. Yeah. You knew Smith was going to come in that door the minute he heard, you know, first call to taps. You knew yes. you knew so and so was probably sometime this week going to say, Hey, I got a medical appointment. I knew you well, knew your people intimately is what yeah. I'm getting at. I, I, I like that you that, that you're going down this this avenue. And again, I think it's because we have been a lot more uh, as I've been working on my relationship, right? Because that's that's the, one of the things I want to do is I really got I'm I'm great at initial contact and and I can talk to people and um I, I, it's me that's just who I am right I'm I'm good at that but then my old beliefs and I'm I'm, I'm breaking them is that man they're gonna find me out but then I I always think about that as like but what are they gonna find out did I grew up in a shitty neighborhood did I had a bad home life did I made mistakes that everybody makes mistakes that, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like all of the stupid stuff that really are irrelevant are, I used, cause then I would be like, oh man. And, uh, and that, that's gone. Like, I don't, I don't feel that anymore. I just, I feel like, yeah, that's who a part of me, but that doesn't define my future. That doesn't define where I'm going to go from here. And if they do find that out, then that's cool because then they're going to realize like how much different, I am now, you know? So, so is, is that something that came post Marine Corps or did you learn that while you were in the Marines about putting your past behind you and being Joe? You know, I think, uh, I think there's, there's always a, a, you, as you progress, there are things that you take, you should take as lessons, um, good or bad, and then just keep progressing. Right. So I think, I didn't realize that during the Marine Corps, but what I did in the Marine Corps was I had something else to think about and something else to focus on. And, and that's where I kind of like learned what I loved doing, which was uh, building a community. Because when I think about this, like I, I remember I had this one conversation with one of one of the, uh, one, one platoon commander. And this is back when I was just Corporal Palacio, Sergeant Palacio, it was fresh, right? And, uh, and I, and I was a squad leader though. And I was like, man, okay, cool. And then for whatever reason, this platoon commander, every other squad that had an, an issue with a Marine, right? Those squad leaders like, I ah, fuck those guys. I can't handle them. And the platoon commander would go, okay, Palacios, can you trade them with so-and-so? And at one point I was like, man, sir, why do you keep giving me these guys that the other squad leaders keep having problems with? They want to give up. And he says, because you motivate people. He goes, because you get people to find the best in themselves. And I was like, oh, fuck, shit. I never thought of that. Uh, and I never really thought of that. And then, and then as I thought about it, it's because I never held expectations on Marines that came to my squad or that Marines were under my thing. And but when I say I didn't hold expectation, I held them accountable to what they, what they had to do. But I didn't say, oh, that Marine that came from first squad to my squad is coming because he's a shit bag and I got to keep an eye on him because he's going to fuck up. Right. Were, were they all shit bags? No, I, I, in the end they weren't, uh, in the end we used to, like, and then people used to go, man, Palacios, you're getting all of those guys that the other squads don't want. And I'm like, so let's prove, let's prove who's got the better squads. And I would consistently go, let's have a squad event. We'll do rifle squads, PT scores, and whatever. And some of these other squads had guys that were like, I mean, they run the three mile in like 12 minutes. But that's the one guy, right? And then everybody else runs it in 23 minutes because yeah. that's their mentality wasn't a community. Like I was building a community of guys because I think it was something I craved when I grew up, right? Um, and I say I grew up in a shitty area and a shitty neighborhood and all that, but what that 
happened is the other people that had that same hardship, the other kids that were my age that were growing up in that same hardship were able to bond. And we did stupid shit, but we had fun together and we took care of each other and we looked out for each other. Right. right. So, um, and then I went to the Marine Corps and I said, well, let's, I'm, I'm just going to do the same thing because I don't know anybody. So let's just find the guys. What can we, what do we have in common? How can we build on it? And then let's complete our mission. And then that's just how it happened. So, so now going forward to getting out mentally, how were you after you got out? Well, I mean, I had, you know, I mean, I had issues getting out. I don't, I, I, I wasn't ready. It was kind of like forced upon me. I had to fight to be, to, to retire. So I think initially I was bitter at the Marine Corps, but I miss Marines. And then, uh, and then I took on, a, I took on a mission to try to help Marines to kind of keep me going. Um, what was that mission? Well, actually what I was working on is at the time we were still in the heat of, of OIF and we were still getting hammered with the um, improvised explosive devices. Right. And my dog background, uh, cause just before I retired, I, I, and I, we talked about you earlier, right? I retired as a staff sergeant, which is like the first rung of staff non-commissioned officers. Right. But when I retired, I was uh, I was working as a, G, a one MEF G three training chief. So part of my job was to validate pre-deployment training for the entire First Marine Division, for for the uh, the Air Wing, the logistics group. Um, so. Yeah, although my rank never got me, and I think it's because I talked a lot and I and I made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but um, I was able to do my job better. And and again, I, I did a good job. And people, and again, I built relationships where other Marines go, "Hey, man, we're gonna ah, we got this great opening for you. We want to we want to help you out and get you over to First Marine Division and work for them." Or, "Oh, hey." Palacios, man, thank you so much for working with us. We're going to get you over to one map. And that's kind of like literally when I think about my career, the most valuable thing was me building relationships with people. Um, uh, and, and those that I never got to build relationships with, I think, uh, I, I think we did each other a disservice for not doing it because yeah. the ones that we did, like together, we worked successfully. Like, Every master gunnery sergeant that I worked with or every master sergeant, some of the first sergeants that, that, that allowed me the opportunity. Uh, oh, man. Gunnery Sergeant Bemis at the time, 4th LAR. Man, I owe that guy so much because he actually pulled me aside once and he said, man, I think your talents are wasting over there. And he goes, because you're not building the right relationship. He goes, he goes, but if we, if, and when we ever go to combat, I'm going to put you in my vehicle. And, and, it, and, and he did, uh, if not, I was going to end up in a logistics vehicle with a, a gunny. And it was just, I was going to, I was not going to do it. wasn't going to be a good time. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't going to, I, I think I wasn't, I would have been, uh, worried that I, I wasn't participating enough to help the Marines that I wanted to be next to, right? Like, hey, th there's nothing wrong with the supply chain and there's nothing wrong with those that support the front line. But I just knew that, um, and I, again, maybe it's me ringing my own bell, but I really felt that I was tactically proficient and that I would better serve up there in the front with the other guys. And luckily Gunny Bemis saw that and he pulled me up and uh, literally I was in a vehicle for the initial invasion with three other sergeants and one Lance Corporal, a gunny. <laughs> so uh, we were like the A team, I thought. And then uh, Gunny used to take us, We any patrol, he was like, all right, we're all going. And we would always go. So um Again, we go down the rabbit hole, I think, a lot. Yeah, we, we do, but it's okay. So, no, where I was going with that yeah. was the, this mission that you had to help out the Marines after yes. you got out. So, so what, what, uh, as I was working in the, in, the, in the G3, we had the improvised detector, uh, improvised explosive detector dog program. Um, and this was something that was put together by General Dunford at the time, early on. And, but there was no ownership initially. And we had just, it kind of, they had been doing it for like three years, but 
uh, the war fighting lab was just showing up to battalions and saying, Hey, we have these improvised dogs for your Marine squads to go on patrol with. And they were like, wait, what? So these dogs weren't being utilized. So then we said, well, we got to integrate that better because, uh, I mean, you just can't you can't go into combat with an asset that's supposed to save you and learn how to do it while yeah. you're in combat. So uh, initially, the first the quick fix was let's put these little makeshift kennels on all in, in all of the uh, infantry guys uh, camps on Camp Pendleton, and uh, we started at uh, first CEB. There was a staff sergeant over there. I can't don't I can't remember his name, but me and him literally pulled together. I was calling him from the three. We were trying to find equipment and we built a make, they, they built a makeshift first CEB dog kennel in the back of uh, like right by the pool uh, in 62 area. Cause it was right there in, in uh, San Mateo. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then from there we try to get some more stuff done. Um, and then, and then I was getting out. So I was like, well, let's try to fix this on the outside. So I was on a mission to try to build a kennel outside of Camp Pendleton to provide more integration training because it was just, this is a great asset. I mean, those dogs were amazing at saving lives. And, and for the fact that we couldn't bridge that gap of training and, and increase uh, commanders, basically it was, I understood it. The commanders didn't know how to implement it. So you're not going to use it. And that makes sense, right? It's like me giving you a, a a new rifle and go, hey, man, go to combat. And you're like, but you still have your old rifle. And you're like, I don't have any training on this. I don't know what I'm going to do. What does it become? It's a paperweight. You're going to sling it and you're going to take the one you know. Yep. Yep. So Absolutely. Uh, so it was a shame because I really think those dogs could have saved so many more lives. But, uh, you know, so we learned, and we move on. On a total side note, I don't know if you saw that article I posted on Facebook about the the... I think it was a British rat um, that served five years clearing minefields. A rat? Yes, I have seen those. Uh, look, there's are those going to become standard on. kit? No, but I tell you what. The, I think what you will be one of the other things that's going to be sound weird is I uh, there was some research going through DARPA where they were going to look at uh, bees because bees also have a very sense they they, they have a very uh, acute sense of smell. That's true. They so do. they were gonna they were gonna figure out they were figuring out how to remote control bees to find explosives. So because anyway, oh no! Wow, no. So, that's a so, rabbit hole right there, huh? <laughs> yeah. So when they um, so when this program that you were developing didn't work, and you kind of, I don't want to say we were done with the Marines, but kind of at a point where you. We're now completely separated from right. interacting with your general, you know, day to day with the Marines. How did you handle that? It was difficult. I mean, uh, I, I kind of I, I isolated a lot. I, I had a lot of bad coping mechanisms. Uh, I think I even went. I started going to the casino more. <laughs> I did like everything that you probably don't want to do at first, and then. Um, but then I, I actually started interacting with the dogs more. And then my wife actually was like, you got to do something. So I went to the South Orange County Vet Center, made an appointment, uh, and just started talking. I started going through a group, which was really great, individual and a group. And then my wife said, well, you still need to do something. And then um, she said, I have a client that got a new dog. Do you want to train it? And I was like, not really. Like, I didn't want to interact. And then I started training the dog. And then, uh, and then, and then I started doing that. And then I went back to my old, to the business plan I had for the, the kennel, which is funny. Cause I have it like literally, this is literally right here. This was, uh, so I went back to that, that plan and it's like one mess improvised explosive detector dog, full service kennel proposal. Like I started going back to do that. Nice. Uh, yeah. And, um, and I realized, man, because the dog was helping me and I knew that the dogs were helpful because it was part of our initial plan. And then I started working towards just doing this transitional work program with the dog training center. Um, and that kind of got me fired back up. I, I was working with more dogs and then I was connecting with more people. And, and then um, 
as we're talking right now, I want to say in my head, I started building a village, man. I started building relationships again. I started to, to do the things. And, and in retrospect, where I'm at now, I realize, and, and as I'm talking to you, again, I realize what is important to me, and that's relationships with people, right? Building a community. Because I've been saying this recently, when I think back to the Marine Corps, like, what's important and it's like mark hill andrew it's tommy chase it's max moore it's art guzman right chuck blackburn it's brian c bowers like and it's 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 all those guys it's not sergeant so and so it's not even you know fourth lar or second battalion fifth marines or fucking one meth right it's the people and when i think of as I've, when I, when I progress and I think of what is it? And I was like, oh, it's because I got back into dog training, right? No, it was because I met, you know, the people that I started to train with dogs, right? The Heather Reinhardt's, the, the, all these like great people. And, and even now in the tribe, right? The Vetchpreneur tribe, the Warrior Council, the, uh, the in, intentional connector on Clubhouse, like all of these things, these communities, when I break it down, it's relationships with people that were right. important, right? right? It's not the fact that they're in the warrior council or that they're in the vet tribe or that they were even veterans now that I think about. It. It's that they're good people and I like being around them, you know? So now let me ask you this. Wow. Um, when was your first exposure to what you're calling intention or mindfulness where, so, uh, you, where you went, hmm, this is something that's going to maybe Justin, not help, but just be useful. I, I think, and I, I wasn't sure, it, uh, Justin, how is, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong. Justin Champion. He's on uh, Champier. Yeah. He has, he's on Facebook too. He's in the Vet Tribe. Uh, he also in the Warrior Council. Um, great guy when it comes to like Facebook ads and stuff like that. Kills it. Like he's got some great copy, stuff like that. But anyway, um, he actually did a free, um, like three day ad thing. And I signed up for it because it was free and because he was in the warrior council and I wanted to support. Right. Um, and at the time I was still kind of like <sighs> traveling my idea of what I want to do. Like I wasn't really directed yet. So a lot of it was like, I'll try this because I want to see what it is. Um, and then one of the things he, he was talking, he had mentioned, he was bringing up was abundance mindset and scarcity stuff. And I was like, wow, I thought this was going to be a Facebook ad. Thing. And uh, he had some exercises that he said, consider doing. And I kind of half asked some of them because at the time I was still kind of still learning, right. I'm still right. going. Uh, and then, but I liked it. I liked the idea of that an abundance thing but i didn't do much further research because i was still not there and then i started really diving into the book because then i got into the book more um because i don't know what it was it's just something happened and then uh ryan hunt and justin we were talking about a mastermind that ryan did an e-commerce mastermind and justin just got on to, cl to clubhouse and he, they, it was funny because they said, well, I have an invite, but Joe, we'd love you to go on. I'll share it with you, but we're just worried you're going to get sucked in. <laughs> Which has happened. Uh, yes. He goes, we're worried you're going to get sucked into there and, and whatever. And they were absolutely right. Like 100%. I got sucked in. Um, but it was cool because I think it was right in the middle of this, the pandemic time, uh, January, March timeframe, 2021. Uh, this year or last year? 2021. Yeah? Yeah. Last year. 2020. The, the, the year. COVID oh. year. Okay. So yeah. was this Clubhouse out back then? Yeah. Uh, but it was very exclusive. They hadn't been opened up to Android. There was like maybe a, a million users, if that, at the time. Not even a million yet. And um, I, I thought Clubhouse came out in like October of last year. No, 
of 19 October of 2019 it came out oh okay so I think it was around March and I got on there and I just I was amazed because I think I was already craving conversation like uh now I had that like I was already in the warrior council and we did those weekly calls and it was like amazing because it was like interaction again and and I, I guess again like now I, I'm really talking in retrospect right that it was the craving of relationship and communication with people right because that was happening on the warrior council and I was building like I was sucked in because I needed that connection with other veterans too at the time I think um, I think we all did through last yeah. year for sure so then clubhouse came on and my whole mission with that transitional work program that I just the even with the IDD one um, one of the ideas was to have veterans run the kennel because the dogs I knew were there would be therapeutic, I thought, right? Uh, and then when I expanded that to a transitional work program, it's because at the time I just thought, well, we want to get back into the community. So the dogs are a good bridge to get you to interact. But I didn't, as, as I think now, it's really dogs help you create a relationship with other people because there's a common bond and it's not the dog really. It's just the fact that you get to talk to someone else again in a non kind of like direct way. Right. Yeah. Because you could talk to each other through your cool ass Pomeranian. Right. Like how many Marines have a Pomeranian? I wonder. Uh, I probably more out. than you are willing to admit. <laughs> right. So uh, again, the rabbit hole. So anyway, yeah. yeah uh, so I mean, but like what? So your exposure what? to mindfulness, which you've seemed to gone down the whole goddamn rabbit hole in the last eight months, really only started in the last year and a half. Yeah, yeah. When so I really started, you, to, well, 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 here's the thing: is well, I've on. actually had Stephen and Lane's book for a while, right? But I really didn't start kind of looking through it until you know probably the last year. Well, so okay, Joe. Let me ask you this: You got out in what twelve? Yeah, 2012. So over that last eight years, um, you know, we all know mindfulness and meditation and breath work. Put your flavor on it that you want and being intentional mm -hmm. is really good for mental health. Oh, a absolutely. lot of a lot yeah. of us leave with not so grand mental health. What were your coping mechanisms during that eight year gap for your mental health? Or did you have any? Well, I did, like I said, like um, I struggled in the first few years, but what I, and like I said, I, I got into the South Orange County Vet Center, right? And that really helped. Like, uh, again, when I think about that, again, it's not, again, okay, I got to retain, rephrase that. When I started to build relationships in group, when I started to really kind of communicate and like have that togetherness, man, it's like your podcast, man. It, that was my after the battle campfire going and meeting every Tuesday night with those guys at the South Orange County Vet Center was my after the battle campfire. Like it, it was where I got to talk about the things that um, I assume civilian people wouldn't understand, or I assumed that my wife wouldn't kind of get, or, you know what I mean? That I, and that I needed my military brothers to discuss and 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 some of it was that they wouldn't like my wife wouldn't understand like right. that somebody who hadn't experienced won't understand um but at the same time as i go through this i realize that everybody has traumas right and i think that uh when when we recognize that trauma is trauma then it actually can bring us together but at the same time as i do this i used to let that define the relationship and not move forward right like so in other words I, I for the longest time that group was a way for me to discuss all the bad stuff right but i never got into the idea of okay what's next like yeah those are bad things but let's move forward man like and let's start talking about what do we do now right and that's just a recent thing for me.
So did they give, so the group thing's interesting. Um, every group I've been in, I've wanted to shoot everyone around me because everyone wanted to play. I was more hurt or wounded or had a worse experience than anyone else. You know, here's, I, you know what I attribute but this to Tommy? Let me ask the team you this. leader in the group. Uh, don't even go there. That person sucked. <laughs> anyway. Oh, uh, see, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. And I've only done it once. Uh, after that first time, the guy, the guy who ran the group was 15 minutes late. So, oh, that's gonna hurt. yeah. And he made it kind of sound like it was intentional. Oh. So that's that. my group experience as it is. But that being said, what, what I was really going for tools to use was yes, group can be helpful. Hanging out at a bar could be like a group too. Mm -hmm. But what about in your alone time? In my alone time, back then, I, 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 I didn't. I tried not to have any. I think is what I did. And then when I, and then when I was, it was, it was probably bad coping mechanisms until I got to group, right? Or until I was able to kind of like I would let. Uh, I don't know. We. I, I realized that it was. I was like. I was really up and down. Um, so I, I wouldn't cope right unless I was in group. Does that make sense? I don't know if that answers. No, it your absolutely question. does. Yeah. So um, when I did use good things, like when I had a dog training client, um, the dog helped and that interaction helped. Uh, when I when I when I would go when I would get on the because like at the time still like right I, I still would hold on to the tragedies and the and and the 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 hardships right that we share. I didn't want to let them go. So what would happen is I would, I would go through a cycle and then, but I would let other things trigger me because I haven't moved on. Right. Because I did just talk about the bad things and not the way forward. If something happened, I would let it do this whole trigger and go down. Like, see, you just can't do it. And then I would kind of dive back down. It's, uh, so yeah, that's, so even though I had, I, I would use good stuff. Like I had, there were occasions when I had good coping mechanisms, but because I was only using them to the point where to, uh, to, to ease the pain and not move forward from it, they would come back. Right. I would let it, I would let the false beliefs kind of grow again. Anyway, so good. now cut to last year. Um, when people started talking about breathing and setting these intentions, something that probably you weren't necessarily on board 100% with right off the bat, how, how did you take it when people started throwing this out as ideas? Uh, well, I mean, at first, look, again, at first, the idea was to, to go in to Clubhouse and I had a mission, right? It was to build to build this network, to help build Maxwell Soaps up, to help build, you know, all of these other things, to grow a community. But I didn't realize that, that, that at the time um, I was setting an intention to grow a community, right? Like build a relationship. But I use, I use the idea of, oh, it's just for the business stuff to hide it. So I wasn't, I was listening but I found myself going back to listen more and, and, and really started, it really started to resonate when what people were sharing were the feelings that I had that I wanted to share that, that I wanted all of my veteran community to share because, because I think in the end, it's a, it's, it's a, our veteran community seems to have a, a heart for sharing, right? Like for service and for higher purpose. And I used to assume that most civilian people don't think that way, right? That they're selfish, that it's really all about them and that they don't understand that you could still be an individual and still work for a higher purpose or a common kind of goal. So I had that assumption. But when I started to hear people share like intentions, Today I want to be. Uh, I want to lead with gratitude, and I want to have purpose, and I want to help my community do this or whatever. Right? I started to go, "Holy crap! We are all still the same. Just our idea of how to get there is different." And that's when I really started to kind of listen, and then I really thought 
man, what a, what a novel idea that I could just set an intention and then make actions towards it. But it wasn't because after that, I was like, you know what? I have another guide and, I, and I've been reading that and it's the same thing, but I just haven't been applying these ideas. Um, and so then my wife got on 70, well, there's more. And my wife got on the 75 hard challenge. And then I started to watch her do things that are intentional and that uh, she doesn't think it because it's a challenge, but she was like, I got to wake up in the morning and I got to work out twice. So she would set little actions to make sure that she worked out twice, right? Routine, setting these things up, stuff that, I mean, it, I mean, if you work through Stephen Lane's book, it's going to be about finding out what your true purpose is and then just taking imperfect actions to get there, right? Um, but what's great about all of this stuff is that in the end, and, and I'm at that point in everything that I've been growing with, I'm at this point right now where it's on me now. Like everyone gets to a point in your growth and self-help. Every guru that you will talk to, eventually you're going to get to a point where it's like, hey man, these are all the tools. These are all guides. These are all resources. But if you want the life you want, you got to put one foot in front of the other. You got to take that one first bite of the elephant or that one first imperfect action uh, and you got to do the work. Uh, and what's fun, what's, what's great about that is it's really not that hard to do no, the work. You're, you're, you're right. Where I was going with that is so um, actually two things. One, um, most of the people I follow, it's blatant or upfront, you know, Nothing in the world's going to change until you take responsibility for it and make the change or that you, you need to start making the change yourself yeah. first, first and foremost, don't read a single page of our book until you're ready to make change. It's the old yes. addict mentality. You're not going to get someone to quit alcohol unless they're ready to quit alcohol. No matter how many times you throw them in rehab or in jail, they're not going to quit. But the yeah. second part point I want to ask you was, what to you, what is setting an intention? Uh, Cause everyone talks about, Oh, I set intentions. I'm going to be intentional with my eating. I'm going to go do this and be intentional this way. But what does it mean to you to actually set an intention? I, I, I think for me, it's a, it's, it's to, for me, the, the setting the intention is, is kind of giving yourself a direction, right? So it's, it's, I'm going to work towards this goal today. Like, so my intention, and, and for me, it's more, uh, as, or at least on the journey that I'm at, when I set that intention, it's more about how I want to feel at the end of the day. And, and the only way to, to get to that feeling is to accomplish some of the tasks that I set, or at least make progress towards them, right? Like, and, and, and to trust that as long as I focus the time and effort towards that intention, then I'm going to get there. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's and, and focus on the process, not necessarily the outcome is where it's gotten to me. That's kind of what a, setting an intention is for me. So right? it's my compass, it's my compass, my compass so, and my map. So intent, dumb it in, down. intention setting is one small aspect of overall I don't want to say mental health, but overall getting better. And I think mindfulness is another one. Are you practicing a lot of mindfulness? Well, see that that's been part of my, my, my kind of growth right into this, the, into the, uh, this whole, everything that I'm doing. Yes. Because if I, I have to kind of reevaluate where I sit, and, and, and how I'm feeling and, and be mindful that I do have triggers still and that this is a process, that it is growth. So yes, um, I have been practicing a little bit more mindfulness, right? And I think we actually had a conversation about this the other day and, and joking about how I know where my, I, I know, and, and, and now you, I share it more. Like uh, I copied some picture and now every time anybody sees that I'm saying, there's a shirt and says, hold on while I overthink this. Because that's what I do. I know I'm going to overthink it, but I'm finding that and, I, and I'm 
kind of talking to that inner voice that makes me want to overthink, you know, uh, there was a technique where someone was saying that if you should name that inner voice, right? Because it it's the one uh, it's the one that uh, only way if it's criticizing, like it's the criticism inner voice. There's several of them, right? Did you get? But I'm more mindful of that inner one that's kind of the criticism, and uh, I'm able to kind of joke. I jokingly tell him to kind of butt out of it and just let me let me, just let me take a little imperfect action, and we'll figure it out later, right? Uh, go back to that old marine thing. <laughs> it's it's easier to it, maybe it's it's better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. permission. Yeah. So yeah. okay. On that note, then I got to <laughs> ask you. Um, for you, which one came first, being intentional or being mindful? Wow, I think uh, I think being mindful. So, what is now? Mindful and and I, well, mindful is just being aware of your your state. Like you're aware. Being mindful is it is that I know that right now I am in a state of anxiety or uh something triggered me maybe i don't know exactly what it is but i'm mindful that my my body's changing that my thought patterns are a little bit kind of in the negative or in the pot like or, or over or over anxious like I, I i'm just more aware of how i'm feeling and and i'm definitely uh but but before i would just be aware of it and i just let it sit there oh, now okay. I, I actually can now I actually, when I'm aware of it, I can kind of like be more intentional of what I do because of it. Does that make sense? No, like, yeah, that, that absolutely makes yeah. sense. So mindfulness kind of opened you to be intentional. So you set your intention and you use your mindfulness to keep you on your path, basically. Well, man, I got to say, like, I don't, again, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking not, in retro. Yeah, I'm thinking, in, I got to say this, look, I've always kind of, felt that there's more to to growth right even before like when i was in the core and i kind of went out but i always kind of dismissed it right um and and now as i'm I'm learning like i'm more open to to and again maybe it's because i set an intention to be more open to new things right like that's kind of part of my growth and I, but there's a lot of these techniques and a lot of these things that I see that I've known before and, uh, uh, and I've applied them in different ways for different things, but never as a whole encompassing well, wellness, right? Does that, right. yeah. No, no, that totally makes sense. So yeah, like, I, like, like, like I knew about mindfulness. I know about meditation. I've even heard of, uh, of abundance mindset. And I mean, the whole letting go. And I mean, that's a lot of stuff. I actually took a uh, social psychology class, right? Where they talk about persuasion and the power of community and how like this whole thing, like all of this, like, and, and uh, as I was going through these intentions, it, it's uh, one of the things that really opened me up as I started to follow through on it and read it was he talks about Maslow's hierarchy Our, of needs. needs. Yeah. Right. And, and um, just, I mean, basic learning theory, it's, it's everything. It's so, again, I got to go back to, we have been taught that complexities are better than simplicities for some reason. Like we think that the more complex a system is, the better it has to be. When oh, in the that end, true? man, well, not necessarily. I mean, if you look at I'm high kidding. performance, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you're pulling my leg. So, I mean, high performance people do this, do, do they do the mundane exceptionally. The routine they have down, right? They, they do the basics every day, all the time. Well, you can apply that to anyone that we consider a genius or smart. Yes, there are people who are inherently genius level intellect, but People who we look up to, rightly or wrongly, uh, many times are no smarter than you or I. They just applied their mentality and their ability to think to the subject that they are experts at. Exactly. Like, 
I'm pretty certain if you dressed Neil deGrasse Tyson up in camouflage and told him to make his way across the field without getting spotted by the enemy and put him next to a seven deployment uh, Marine Corps sniper, the sniper's going to look a lot smarter than him. He just decided yeah. to focus his brain power on astrophysics. It's yeah. not that anyone is any more smarter. They're just more intentional to what they're trying to follow. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I love that the way you put that. It's true. It's, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's that, and that's, I, I mean, I'm, I've been annoyed with myself that the fact that this idea of intention is so easy and it's just like, but see, I think, I think there was one issue that you may have and that a lot of people with intentions have is you can set an intention peripherally today. I'm going to, I intend to get a lot of work done, but without a deeper consideration of what that actually means. Yes. You get a lot of work done. Is it yep. the work that needed to get done? Correct. Yes. And I think you see now that you're, you're going to there, I think that 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 kind of segues into the idea of, of hustle and flow, doesn't it? Wouldn't, wouldn't you think there's a difference between like if I'm setting an intention to to I'm hey, my intention today is I'm gonna do a lot of work. Oh shit, what does that mean? Yeah. Is it, is it a lot of work in the yard? Is it a lot of work in the garage? Is it a lot of work on my business? Is a lot of work on my relationships, my family. Like, what is a lot of work? And so you can I, trick yourself into doing a lot of work and not meeting your goal. Well, so I was watching a podcast or listening to a podcast yesterday with um, a woman who does a lot of visualization work. And she walked through this visualization where she's like, this is like a basic exercise I do with one of my clients. And we're talking like, as they're walking, as she's visualizing walking up to this house that she got, she's talking about how the asphalt felt underneath the soles of her shoes, the smell from the cedar in great detail. Mm -hmm. And the, the point of that for her was because she's like, I've seen so many people visualize success and have gotten it, but mm -hmm. not in the field or the position that they wanted to, because they didn't put that out there. And I think that's a problem with intention too, is like we said earlier, it's great to say, I'm going to get work done today. But unless I say, I'm going to get work done today, that's going to take this podcast to the top 10 at Apple iTunes. And here's how I'm going to get there. Yes. There's a big difference between work and actually putting the work in. And that's the other follow on thing. Right. So, well, I mean, the difference between work and being intentional in your work. Right. And, and the only way to do that is to, is to, is to, articulate that in your intention like right now there's a, a, uh it has nothing to do with the it, it's well it is it, they're all intent like everybody everyone is talking about taking actions to what you want which is just being intentional like that's just uh i don't know i mean it's this yes you have to take those steps you have to be imperfect actions or even plan like I, i've even gone to the point where you still have to plan something like everything can't be willy-nilly and just in the wind so right. you have to be planned and you know, exactly imperfect so, right you got to do a little bit of both so let me ask you this question then so you you got the intention you use a mindfulness to keep you on the track to the end goal of your intention Mm -hmm. do you use breath breath work meditation at all as of right I, I just i would say i just started doing some guided meditation and and that's um that's the uh, because of uh, chris delaney the intentional connector he has a he did a really good guided discussion or gui a guide he's got a really good uh, he sent with us so that's been my first kind of guided meditation um and it's 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 an intentional one. It's, it's, uh, about sharing energies and all that and, and, um, communicating with my higher self, which has been really kind of phenomenal because I, I would only say in the last two weeks where I've really kind of focused on that, uh, evening meditation, it's an evening meditation, um, for guidance, for creation, right. 
like, and, and it's been very helpful. Um, at first it was kind of intimidating to, to kind of try to visualize who I would think of as my higher self. Right. Um, and then to have that higher self share gifts with me and, and to kind of, which is again, man, I'm new to this. So it's kind of, again, I think it took a while to kind of really kind of get into that state where I could really do that, but right. it's been very helpful, man. Like literally I've found so much um, guidance in like the last week. Um, and I know uh, I've been kind of silent on certain things. Um, I haven't been as out there on clubhouse or even in Facebook posting the way I normally do. And that's just because I've been kind of, uh, creating kind of in, in myself, I've been writing a little bit more. I've been working on, um, new business plans and, and, and new collaborations and stuff like that. So it's been really great. So, so, so speaking pretty of soon uh, it's just putting everything together. So speaking of writing, cause I, I feel like the, in the headspace in the mental space, you have mindfulness, you have meditation or breath work, you have um, intention. And I think one of the most important things, at least for me, is journaling. Have you done that or gotten into that at all? I, I, what I've been doing is I've been writing notes in, in small little excerpts when they pop up. Uh, I haven't done... I, you, I'm really cons- uh, thinking of doing, I think you had mentioned it once, maybe just do a dictation too, like when those thoughts are there and I'm in a creative space or even, uh, I haven't necessarily journaled where I go, Hey, right now I have to sit down and journal. What I've been doing is, uh, I just been writing whenever I have a, a thought, an idea, I'll write it down. Okay. Um, but what I, I have been consciously sitting down and going, okay, I got to do a plan. So that's, uh, so yeah, no, but I definitely need that. That's one of my, well, I'm at that point, man. I'm in that creative point. And I think an actual journal is probably the best. And then, and then to do it at certain times, I think, and maybe even ask for like a creative time. I don't know. I, again, I'm, I'm learning, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for me, it's, five o'clock in the morning when I get up uh, before I even get out of bed, it's right next to the, it's right next to the dresser lights come on and Mm -hmm. I write for about five, 10 minutes and then head downstairs to do other stuff, including a morning meditation. I use uh, this ring. It's a uh, fitness tracking ring called aura. And on their app, they have some really good shorter eight, four to 10 minute meditations. I do every morning. Can we take and a quick break, Tommy? I, actually, I need well, to wrap up because I got another podcast coming up here a little bit later. Yeah. So let's do this again soon. Yes. For let, sure. let me get, let me come back and say goodbye. Hold on. And Joe just took off to go do something. I'm not hundred percent sure what, but yeah. So you guys, um, well, we're cutting down some time here. Check out, um, uh, what is it? I'm trying to remember the name of the app. It is drawing a blank. Why am I drawing a blank? Why am I drawing a blank? Headspace. If you want to learn how to meditate, it's a good, it, they give you like uh, 30 days free. And the first like 10 days, they take you through guided meditations and they have a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, again, if you have an aura ring, the app there is really good for you. Also, if you have an Apple watch, you have, um, I think it's called moments that will help you with breathing. You just follow the, the rhythm and guidance. And of course, as always, you can always go out to YouTube or any of the other sites and go ahead and just Google, uh, YouTube, some mindful, uh, some breathing techniques for breath work and meditation. You have people like Wim Hof with his techniques, um, I apologize, Tommy, the kid, uh, my wife needed my help. <laughs> the other one had a bloody nose real quick. Oh, okay. Ugh, life, right? Ugh. Yeah. So anyways, we got to wrap this up, but Joe, thank you so much for coming on. No. Oh my God, man. This was, I, I was way more comfortable. I really felt, uh, amazing doing this with you, man. And, uh, Thanks. I know we were like, 
we we kept missing and and everything, but um, I think it turned out really great. And I really I, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for sticking with me, man. No worries. Man. I think uh, <laughs> all right, brother.